Welcome to the latest episode of the Hunter Baumgart Sports Podcast. My name is Hunter Baumgart, your host. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Hunter B on Air. Be sure to like the Facebook page as well, Hunter Baumgart Sports. Remember, you can watch or listen to the podcast. You can watch on YouTube or listen on SoundCloud. Just search Hunter Baumgart Sports Podcast. Well, today we have another interview of a Wisconsin radio personality, Justin Garcia. He is the Bucks studio host on the Bucks Radio Network, and he also works for WTMJ and ESPN Milwaukee. And like I said, he's the studio host and does the pregame show and the postgame show for the Milwaukee Bucks Radio Network. So I'm going to ask him about the the Bucks in general. What does he think this break hurts or helps the Bucks? Also about his career. How did he get to WTMJ and how did he get to the Bucks Radio Network? All of that right now with Justin Garcia. Joining us on the Hunter Baumgart Sports Podcast is Justin Garcia. He is the pregame and postgame uh, studio host for the Milwaukee Bucks Radio Network and works for WTMJ and ESPN Milwaukee. He is also, uh, you can follow him on Twitter at TMJ Garcia. Justin, really appreciate the time this afternoon. I'm excited to get to know you a little better and uh, start to talk about the uh, NBA restarting. Yeah, same. Uh, thanks for reaching out. Yeah, no problem at all. So first, I just want to ask you kind of what I've been asking everybody is how are you doing these past few months? Obviously the world's been on pause and so has the NBA. <laughs> um, I don't want to be a downer, but I feel like my answer is going to be pretty similar to my friend Bard. Uh, yeah. Not good. I mean, yeah, I, I know. So if we go back to that week, mm -hmm. I was um, in my apartment watching the Mavericks game and preparing for the Bucks Celtics game the following day. And um, all of a sudden I was looking through Twitter and just saw the tweet of the NBA suspended its season and, well, you know, what is happening? And then immediately flipped to anything I could find that was reporting on it. But just the feeling of, so during the season, uh, I always tell people, the off days are more busy for me than game days because those are the days where the Bucks have a practice or a scrimmage and you're pulling audio and you're writing your scripts and you're figuring out what am I going to say in the pregame or when we do the postgame show, uh, if it's a bad game, is there a topic ahead of time that I know we can focus on this? Whereas the game, I'm just watching it. Like I'm doing yeah. the pregame and you're reacting at halftime and you're reacting in the postgame, but it, it's, it's pretty easy. You're just going through the game. Um, so just that feeling of seeing that news and then knowing, I guess I could stop working <laughs> on this game tomorrow. But then, you know, once you got to the weekend and it was Friday and I had an entire weekend where I had literally nothing to do for the first time since, you know, I can't even remember being unemployed after college mm -hmm. and then just living through that every single week. Um, the first month probably month and a half was pretty rough because, you know, I do a lot of things. So my average work weeks during the NBA season are, are close to 90 plus hours wow. because, you know, in addition to that with the radio side and with the bucks, I also have a full-time employer. So mm. uh, those are really crazy weeks. And, you know, having about that month of realizing I mean, this is it where thankfully I do, you know, I'm grateful that I have that other employer where I wasn't impacted as severely financially as others were. Um, but not knowing what it's like to have, you know, come four or five o'clock in the afternoon, it's free and the entire weekend is free. So it was a pretty rough adjustment. And I think like a lot of us, that first month or so, you know, you watch Netflix and, uh, you watch movies and you stay inside and then you can find it kind of feel yourself getting down that it basically like took a month of it to figure out, okay, I, sure. I got to come up with a plan here and I, I have to do some things just to stay active and mm -hmm. not just shut down. And the hardest part was, you know, sports are gone and you see how much your life revolves around yeah. sports and planning your day around that. Um, but even things as much as like watching old sports, I just couldn't do it. Like I saw everybody jumping into when, whether it was MLB network or NBA network or NBA TV and, and whoever it was replaying old games. Yeah. I just couldn't bring myself to do it because then you see the crowd and you realize, well, when are we going to have this again? 
Exactly. I've, I, I felt the exact same way and I still do to a sense. Now we've got a little more hope. So I kind of feel like, you know, it's a little bit better. Have you done any uh, like radio work during this time or has it just been kind of just hoping that the NBA comes back and kind of thinking about how you'd go about that once it does? No, it's been uh, very brief. I mean, I've done interviews okay. and uh, we re-air some old games, mm. uh, Bucks games on ESPN Milwaukee where I'll, I'll voice a halftime package for that but sure. um you know our industry was hit pretty hard where you can attest to it um yep. the problem with no sports is most of your sponsorship money comes from sports so when those games are gone that money is gone and uh, you know i'm part-time at the radio station so we had to look at can we afford to pay part-time workers so I, I haven't done anything in terms of hosting a show remotely or going into the radio show uh, radio station since what march 10th i believe wow yeah do you know what i was going to ask you this as well do you know what your role might be when the nba comes back or have they not let media kind of know i'm kind of hearing that they don't really know yet no so i've been in the camp of i'll find out when i need to find out that i'm okay. sure there's probably you know bigger fish to fry for the league right now that yeah I would, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I can't assume that I'll be back is something I've been trying to say is who knows, maybe the financial losses have been so drastic that they say we need to just go bare bones here. Mm -hmm. um, but so I have to have myself, you know, ready for that possibility. But I would assume, you know, I feel like I'll be back. Um, but I, I would guess there wouldn't really be I know behind the scenes, our uh, leadership at the station is working on uh, how are we going to pull this off? Because yeah. uh, we haven't been told officially, but I have to believe everything local is going to be done remotely, TV, yeah. and radio. Mm -hmm. um, so figuring out, okay, how do we pull this in? How do we sync it up where you can actually see what's happening? Right. Do we have to go into a, a bigger delay and we're just calling it off the TV? So I would guess that information would start to come out at some point in July, but mm -hmm. I mean, the overall plan that we heard, um, what a month ago or so, a couple of weeks ago when we heard uh, July 31st was gonna, when they were gonna mm -hmm. return. I think a lot of us looked at it and said, uh, okay, there's still a lot of stuff we need to know about uh, safety and health and what are they gonna do yeah. for testing and what are their plans around that. I assume they have that. They're just ironing out the details and we'll find out later. The thing that I was somewhat discouraged by is mm -hmm. in the weeks that then followed where some more started to trickle out, it seemed like there wasn't a plan, that the plan was July 31st, we're coming back, we'll figure out the rest later. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, it's still very fluid. I would be stunned if, you know, when Kyrie Irving first made his comments and people were saying, maybe the NBA won't come back now. They're coming back. I think yeah. the train has already left the station to borrow yeah. the uh, Mike McCarthy phrase. But, um, you know, even if they had superstars, which I don't think happens, but even if they had a number of superstars say, I'm not showing up, I think they're playing anyway, just because mm -hmm. they need uh, the money. I just, you know, some of the things in the 130 page or 13 page document they just released too, where you read through it and you think, was this just planned like yesterday? Like how, <laughs> how long was this given thought? Cause yeah. Kyrie Irving raised some serious concerns and they're valid, mm -hmm. but he's not the greatest messenger. We know that. And <laughs> some of his, maybe there were ulterior motives there. Um, but you do have to be somewhat concerned that right now, what's the state you would point to and say, this might be the worst Florida. Mm -hmm. right. And you're doing everything in Florida and we're seeing yeah. things like, Disney employees don't have to remain in the bubble. Um, that does have to raise some concern for some of the players. So really, and I would assume this is the message they're getting um, from the NBA and from their players association too. I mean, you guys have to be very diligent about this, that uh, there are these concerns with what's going on in Florida and that you may come into contact with staff at Disney. So you need to make sure you're taking this seriously and do your best to make sure we don't have this spread rampantly. Yeah, it's going to be, yeah, there's so much. And, and it kind of goes along the lines of, of baseball as well. Like, sure, they can get all these economic things done, but they're, 
health wise, it is going to be the biggest challenge for any of these sports to come back. It just is. And, and being, what do you do if someone tests positive and all of that as well? Justin Garcia, he's the studio host for the Monkey Bucks Radio Network, joining me on the Hunter Baumgart Sports Podcast. I do want to talk a little bit about, and, and we'll get to, um, we'll get to the on the court stuff in a little bit. I am curious just how, uh, what your, what your career has been like, I give you the Bucks Radio Network. I know you did go to UWL, so you're a fellow UWL grad, go Eagles. Um, but I just was wondering, you know, what it, was it quickly after graduating that you went to work for WTMJ? Were there other stops, stop, or stops along the way? Uh, what has your career been like? So uh, pretty unconventional. And mm-hmm. my story is really similar. Again, I'll bring them up to, to Bart, where sure. um, we overlapped, I believe, at UWL. I think in lacrosse, I was gone, I think, two years before Bart left. Okay. Um, but... I worked in radio for the ESPN affiliate. Oh, okay. At, uh, I don't think it's even what it is now, but it was WFBZ. It was part of the lacrosse radio group. Sure. And I started there because I moved to lacrosse. I needed a job. And this was my uh, junior year of college that I went up there. So I needed a job. And I saw an ad in the paper for, hey, uh, entry-level radio position, great way to get your foot in the door. And I had just left an interview with Rocky Rococo's in Alaska and saw that ad and thought, I don't want to deliver pizzas. I'd rather do this. So I called right. and it was immediate where they were like, Hey, great. Uh, it was a, it was a, a Friday afternoon and I talked to the program director and it was cool. Can you show up tomorrow morning? <laughs> sure. So I showed up Saturday morning. I got there at uh, 7.30, okay. I think it was, which for a college junior is pretty yeah, rough. Right. <laughs> and uh, I showed up, I trained with someone um, to basically board up a Badger game. Okay. And my whole training was I showed up, he lets me in and basically takes me into the studio and says, here's your board, here's where the game comes up, here's where the commercials come up pull the commercials up when it's time for that and pod down the Badger feed. Then when it's done, go down to the basement and switch the satellite feed. And at this point, I'm, I have no idea anything that he's saying. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take you down and show you. So we go down to this basement and he shows me, here's how you switch the satellite feed when the game's done, switch it to ESPN radio. Like, okay. He's like, all right, you got it? Sure. Thinking this guy's going to be here with me. And he just leaves. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm on my own to board off this thing. And he left me the program director's number. If anything came up, I think I had to call him to figure out again, how do I switch this over? Yeah. So then from there, it was Monday where he calls me again because I wasn't technically an employee. It was just show up yeah. and, and, and learn and whatever. So then Monday he calls me. He's like, oh, do you want to come back and do it uh, Friday? So then it mm-hmm. gradually became that where I just kept doing more and more and more. Uh, I remember I was making $5.15 an hour. Oh my God. So my checks were yes. huge. Um, so I did that. I did a lot of board hopping because we had two different stations where we had an AM and FM. Mm-hmm. So we would run um, different sporting events on, the, on stations at the same time. We did a lot of NASCAR mm-hmm. and the AM station would usually carry um, ESPN's feet of baseball or football on Sundays. So I would board up that. I would do a lot of uh, board hopping for, our uh, high school football games oh, sure. and for turbo and lacrosse games that we would do there. Um, and then we did a Saturday afternoon racing show that I would run the board for. So I did that for uh, that year. Okay. And then uh, when it came time for the spring, I started looking for internships in Milwaukee. So I was able to get an internship at WTMJ. So that summer of uh, 2003, uh, my responsibilities were basically to cover the brewers. So I was at just about every single brewers home wow. game. Um, yeah. I mean, it was great for a college yeah. kid experience right. and, and you know, you're part of the media right. basically in the park, but that brewers team was horrendous. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> that part, not so good, but that's basically how I spent my entire summer. Okay. And when I went back to lacrosse, then the following fall, I reached out again to the program director and said, you know, it's funny to think of now, but like, Hey, do I still have a job here? And of course yeah, I right. did because nobody wanted to do what right. I was doing. Pushing <laughs> for the bank. Uh, so he's like, yeah, sure. And not only that, we'll let you do some more on air stuff. So I mm. was still doing all of that. 
And then we had only one local show, which was called The Local Show. Mm. And it was on from, I think, three to five, something like that in the afternoon. And um, I still remain in touch with those guys. And it's guys Mm. that have, like, when you think of how small lacrosse is and how small that station is, the uh, people that I worked with at that station Mm -hmm. were John Audius, who's the volleyball men's volleyball voice of the Badgers, Phil Dawson, who used to do basically what I'm doing for the Bucks, he did it for the Badgers, and Ben Larson. And those were the four of us that were basically running that station at the time. Um, So I just did more and more, and uh, I started to do some on-air stuff. I started to do some play-by-play there, and I started to do uh, sports updates on that show and uh, went back and interned for WTMJ again the following year, went back to school for a fifth year, and Mm -hmm. basically just, I think I was only taking like nine credits and was basically just working in radio. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a lot of radio for a station outside of the campus that I was doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember still like working, it's crazy to think, I was working close to 40 hours when I was going to school. And getting my checks for 40 hours of work and seeing that it's like $180. <laughs> right, exactly. um, so I did that. And um, I started taking a lot of uh, like video editing and TV classes. Mm, sure. And um, one of my professors had worked for um, a commercial production suite for charter when they were mm. the hubs that would make commercials uh, before he came. And he still had a lot of connections there. And he was kind of like, you know, I know you like radio, but it's not the greatest industry to get into. It doesn't pay well. Right. So uh, like through some of that and hearing him say that and some of the connections he had, mm-hmm. I ended up doing commercial production for the first three years out of college mm-hmm. where I just left radio altogether. And um, I was in Madison. I was uh, around all those names that I mentioned before. They had all left the cross and moved to work for radio stations in Madison. So I was still okay. seeing those guys and hanging out with them and talking with them and realized like, "Ah, I made a mistake. Like, Mm. this is what I want to do. Yeah. I quit my job and no prospects or anything. Just moved back to Milwaukee. Mm. Had to move in with my parents, got a job at uh, WTMJ through the guy that hired me as an intern where basically I just emailed him out of the blue and said, do you have anything? Mm -hmm. I don't think they did, but he brought me in to talk anyway. Sure. And uh, from there, I started off only working two days a week. I was just yeah. doing Friday and Saturday nights. And it was from six to midnight. So like your entire weekend is shot where you can't yeah. do anything. Right. I wasn't really doing anything fun. I was just running the board for like the Dennis Miller show and, and okay. uh, Clark Howard and nationally syndicated shows. Sure. So I just started doing that. And like all of my friends and my family and parents were like, what are you doing? Like, this is crazy for the days (laughs) and the hours and what you're going to make. And I just kept the mentality of like, I'll figure it out and it'll pan out in the long run. So Mm -hmm. it was kind of the same as in the cross where two days then went to three and then three went to Mm -hmm. four. And then it was, we're going to train you to do this. And then I started to back up on Bill Michaels, who I worked with when I interned at at WTMJ. He was still at TMJ. Okay. Uh, hosting our weeknight sports show. So then it was, we're going to train you since you know him to produce his show. So it would be the backup. So after about a year of doing that, uh, Bill's producer, Todd left. Mm. So then I replaced Todd and produced Bill's show for uh, about a year until he left to uh, go elsewhere. Yeah. So there was a time where I had a full-time job. I was producing every single weeknight and then wow. Saturdays and Sundays, I was hosting our weekend show and hosting our Brewers post game shows. Wow. And finally, after like a year of that, they said, technically you can't work seven days a week anymore. So <laughs> you got to cut back. So that's when I stopped producing the show. And from that mm-hmm. point forward, uh, I basically shared hosting duties on our weekend show. I shared hosting duties on, um, Brewers Extra Innings and our weekly Brewers show. And then I would just fill in on um, our sports show. If Greg Matzik or Jeff would take off, I would fill in and host for them. So I did that for uh, about two years, I think. And then um, I just got a, uh, all of a sudden I was just notified, uh, Ted Davis reached out to me and said, 
hey, uh, we're creating this position with the Bucks, and I think you'd be a pretty good candidate for it. So let me know what you think. Um, so I did, little did I know, like this had long been in the works and one of my bosses at TMJ was aware of this and they had kind of probably mentioned me to Ted, like, hey, reach out to him. So I had to submit some demos for that and uh, got the job, I think, less than a week before the season started. And this oh was the, uh, what was this, the 14-15 season, okay. I believe, was the first that I did. So it, it was literally less than a week before it starts. Yeah, I have no idea what this job is. They explained it very vaguely. I had to meet at the Bucks facility with someone from HR and with mm. my boss. And I think Ted was there and they just yeah. went over, here's what we think you'll do. Yeah. Sign the paperwork and we're good. So I remember showing up to the first game and having no idea what to do. Mm. Where Ted opens the broadcast and he talks with Dennis Krause. Yeah. And something like, and this year we've added studio host and cue for me to talk. I had no idea that was my cue. So I'm just sitting there. <laughs> in silence and they had to motion me okay start so yeah right i think back to the first uh two years of that were pretty rough where i'm mm. still amazed because i when i started they told me there, you don't have a contract so it's a year-to-year -year thing but you know don't worry we're not going to fire you unless right. unless you make us fire you right when i think back to those first two years I, i'm still amazed that i lasted more than two years because i just think of like it wasn't until that third year mm -hmm. where, uh, and this was uh, the, the year that they lost to the Celtics in seven. Okay. It wasn't until that year that I think I really figured out, oh, this is like how I should be doing it. And I've, okay. I've told him this and I've told other people this, but the, the, the two guys in my career, well, three that have been the biggest help. Uh, number one is Carl Moll, who's, uh, the guy that I referenced and said my boss there, he's no okay. longer at TMJ, but he's the guy that, you know, I also, I didn't mention, I used to be the producer for our Packers broadcast. Oh, so okay. I worked with Carl on that for about 10 years. Okay. And um, he's the one that gave me all these sports opportunities that would mm -hmm. pop up and kind of looked out for me. But uh, in terms of on air guys, Lance Allen, who I've developed mm -hmm. a friendship with, he's been extremely helpful to me the entire time and Dennis Krause um, mm -hmm. and I, Dennis probably doesn't even know he's doing it. Like I've told him this, whereas Lance has been more of like a hands-on mentor sure. uh, with Dennis. I just learned so much just sitting in the radio booth with him and seeing mm -hmm. here's what he prepares and here's how he prepares. And this is how he does this. And yeah. knowing that those first two years, um, I was nowhere near as ready or prepared as I should have been. And mm. now, you know, I, I approach it as the way I prepare for every game is I'm assuming something's going to happen where Ted loses his voice or Dennis loses his voice and I have to step in. I have to be ready for that. Mm. I wasn't yeah. doing anywhere near that, you know, the first two years on okay. the job where then you realize you got to be ready to, to do your job and other people's jobs if something happens. So, um, you know, I just think it like looking back at those first two years to the amount of work that I've had to put in the last few years. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just crazy to me to think that I was doing the same job. Yeah, exactly. No, that makes sense. And I want to kind of, it's Justin Garcia is joining us, the Bucks studio host on the Bucks radio network. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter at TMJ Garcia. Justin, I do want to ask you, and you, you mentioned a little bit about, you know, sitting next to, to Ted and Dennis. Do you, what is it, you know, a day in the life look like for you during a season, say, whether it's game day or not game day, you mentioned that, you know, non-game days are busier, um, but are, do you, on game day, do you sit, you know, next to Ted and Dennis, or is it, you know, are, are road games, do you travel, you know, what's, give the audience kind of a, a perspective of what you do? Yeah, road games I do uh, from the radio station, okay. so the road games are just me and Ted, uh, home games, it's all of us, so it's me, Ted, Dennis, and our engineer, Ryan. Uh, are all in the broadcast booth, which is much different in Pfizer form than it was in the Bradley Center. Yeah. So we're all seated next to each other in a okay. space that's probably designed for three people. And it's the four of us uh, basically elbow to elbow in that booth. So I, I sit next to, to Dennis and Dennis sits next to Ted. And um, during the games, so I'll basically do the entire pregame show where okay. – uh, it starts, I intro it, I kick it off to Ted and Dennis. They'll do a couple of minutes, pitch to break, and then I take over from there. Yeah. Um, 
once the game starts, I try to serve as basically a statistician for them where mm -hmm. we don't have that. They bring stats into the booth where you can see, okay, uh, Giannis has this many points since the last time out or this many points in the quarter. Um, but if you notice uh, something happening on Twitter or you see a guy leave to go to the locker room and maybe they didn't pick up on it, I'll like give them a, a cue of Dante DiVincenzo just left. Or if yeah. um, you know, somebody hits a three, Brooke Lopez hits a three and it's his 203 as a buck, I'll write down the note and hand it to him so they can pass it on. So mm. home games are like a lot more involved. The tough part of road okay. games for me is – it's so easy to stay engaged during home games because you're yeah. watching it unfold in front of you and you can pick what you want to watch where you don't have to, and you shouldn't uh, watch the ball. You can say, I'm just going to focus on, on Brooke Lopez and what yeah. he's doing against this guy. Whereas road games, I'm in a radio studio and I'm watching the feed on TV mm -hmm. and uh, the TV feed is delayed from the radio feed that I'm hearing in my ear. Right. So you hear Ted say the shot is missed <laughs> and, 10 seconds later, you see it miss. Yeah. So those are tougher. Um, and and it, uh, it's why, obviously, I much prefer home games. Mm -hmm. um, like in terms of my day, I'll usually, let's say it's a 7 o'clock game, mm -hmm. I'll get to the arena anytime between 3.30 and 4. As it, as it relates to the Bucks, and as we're going to see them come back in late July, do you think this stoppage and then resumption of play – will hurt or help the Bucs? Because you see them, obviously, every single game of the year. What do you think for this? Because this team, obviously, is having a fantastic year. But will that continue, do you think, when they resume in Orlando? Uh, I think it's going to hurt every team. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you think about um, teams that made some adjustments at the trade deadline. I think of, like, the Miami Heat, where mm -hmm. – uh, the moves that they made and Andre Iguodala having to work himself back in uh, this kind of levels the playing field for that, where everybody now is going through that layoff and rust. So I think everybody's going to deal with rust. I think the two things are uh, your defense is probably going to be more important than ever now where you just kind of have to assume most of the offense is going to be rusty across yeah. the league. Um, so defense, which we know the Bucks have the best in the league, uh, defense is going to be important. And the other thing is um, the playoffs. I don't think we're going to see any upsets in the first round. You may sure. see uh, – the only one I would really pencil is uh, the Sixers and Celtics. If that's the matchup mm -hmm. that we get a 3-6, maybe you see an upset there. Because the whole Philly thing, where you think about how yeah. bad they were on the road, uh, well, is every game a road game or is every game neutral site? So right. maybe that wipes that out for Philadelphia where you don't have to worry about that. Um, but I think the playoffs are going to come down to, you know, guys like Giannis and James Harden and mm -hmm. um, LeBron. You know your superstars are going to be great. Mm -hmm. I think the playoffs are going to be decided by the number twos on the team and which number two performs best because – uh, of all the things we said with rust and guys getting themselves back into shape. I mean, we can point to the Bucks' depth and say they're the deepest team in the league, which should help. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's true. Maybe yeah. it changes in this format, but you know, in the playoffs depth, sure. It has some value, but you're not playing more than eight or nine guys really. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe it changes for every team. It depends on the conditioning that the players are in. And if you see coaches just say, we're going 10, 11 yeah. guys in the postseason, then that's an advantage for the Bucs. Uh, but I think the advantage that they would hold would be their defense. Mm -hmm. No, that completely makes sense. Well, Justin, I really appreciate the time this afternoon. And um, hopefully we'll be hearing you soon uh, on uh, the Bucks radio network, uh, wherever that may be from. <laughs> you bet, man. Thanks for reaching out. Yeah, no problem. That's Justin Garcia. He is the studio host for the Milwaukee Bucks Radio Network. He does the pregame show and the postgame show and also works for WTMJ and ESPN Milwaukee. You can follow him on Twitter at TMJ Garcia. Well, thanks again to Justin for the time. Really fascinating interview about how kind of he went from lacrosse to Milwaukee and how he got to the to the Bucks job and also he thinks the stoppage and then the resumption of play is going to hurt every NBA team. I think that's interesting. I I actually think it'll help some teams and hurt others. Might have to do a podcast on that. But I think this resumption of the ML, or uh, this break of the NBA season is for a lot of a lot of teams. It's going to help them with rest. I don't think the you know the momentum sure was stopped, and that's going to be something big. But I think 
I think it really helps as far as rest goes for some of these stars. But we shall see, right? Only time will tell. Thanks again for watching or listening to the podcast. Remember, you can watch on YouTube or listen on SoundCloud. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Hunter B on Air. And uh, feel free to like the Facebook page as well, Hunter Baumgart Sports. Once again, thanks so much for watching or listening. Talk to you next week. And as always, stay positive.